Okay, so let's go ahead and start about our topic for today. The topic for today is invasive species. Um, you might have heard of it before, but before we talk about what an invasive species is, let me do a few definitions for you guys. There are two worksheets that I created for you there. Um, if you don't have them, the link is in the uh, about section of this video. So again, there's two different worksheets. One worksheet is a pathway worksheet. So it has you guess how a um, invasive species will get into that area based on the description. And there's another booklet and it's got quite a few different examples that I'm going to go over and you will fill out the different characteristics and you get to color in that invasive species picture. So if you have those, pull them out. If you don't have them, totally fine. You can look at them after as well. It's not a big deal. Okay, so let's first start off with another poll question. We're gonna do some, work on some definitions really quickly. So this first one, so there are three main kinds of ways that we classify species. We have native, non-native, and invasive. So my first question for you guys is, Plants and animals that originated and live in an area without any human um, influence or interaction is considered a what? So no human influence. Is it native, non-native, or invasive? All right, cool. Most of you guys got this. It's a native species. So native species are in the area that they're, that they're supposed to be in. They were not brought there by any human intervention whatsoever. So no one brought them there. They occur there naturally, that's their home, that's where they're supposed to be. All right, so the next one, those that have occurred outside of their natural range, but do not cause harm. So this is a species that has occurred outside of their natural habitat, but it does not cause harm. All right, guys, so the answer is non-native. So a non-native species is something that is not in its normal area. It's been brought there, but it's not causing harm. That's the big thing is it's not causing an issue. Now, non-native species can become invasive. All right. So then next question. All right. Our final definition for you guys, an organism whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm. So an organism whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm. Okay, good, most of you guys are getting this one too. The answer is invasive. So the biggest difference between non-native and invasive is that an invasive species is causing harm, is causing environmental harm, is causing economic harm. It's not supposed to be there and it's causing a problem. Now again, a non-native can become invasive, okay? But invasive species are not native species. Native species cannot become invasive, but non-native can. All right, cool, so guys, Again, an invasive species is something that is not supposed to be there and is causing a lot of harm. Now, why are these invasive species bad? Because they're entering an ecosystem that has no natural predators. So that's the biggest issue there is nothing, when they show up, nothing is there to compete with it. They don't know what it is. And so they can easily survive really quickly because there's nothing eating them or nothing to compete with, their, um, with them. They also will compete with a native org um, organism, so compete for habitat. So they'll push out what's normally there and take over the habitat as their own. They will also destroy habitat. So we're going to talk about a species of plant that actually destroys a lot of habitat um, and destroys a lot of plants and trees. They also eat a lot. Um, there's a few species that just eat everything. There's one species, one invasive species that I'm going to tell you about that has destroyed 98% of the small mammal population in the habitat it is in. So invasive species eat a lot um, and they completely destroy a big section of that ecosystem food chain. They also cause economic issues. So again, think about if they're eating all the fish um, and that's no fish for the fishermen to catch to sell, things like that. Um, and just tourism issues as well. That's another big issue. Um, you know, when you go to an area that has now been wiped out of all the natural animals, people don't want to go there. So those are the main reasons why invasive species are a problem. Now, let me ask you guys this next question. Do you think an invasive species can be brought in on purpose? Can an invasive species be brought in on purpose? Yes or no? Awesome. Most of you guys are getting this one too. That's great. So the answer is yes. Um, invasive species can be brought in on purpose. 
Um, that is actually one example that I am going to give you guys in a second. But a lot of invasive species are actually brought in on purpose and then um, they kind of just explode and it becomes a big problem. So there are four main pathways that um, an invasive species can be brought into an area. So the first one is climate change. So guys, um, we know that in climate change, essentially we are making the planet warmer um, through a lot of different things that we're doing, just using plastic, burning fossil fuels, driving cars, flying airplanes, all those greenhouse gases. We're making the environment essentially warmer and we're making it, we're fueling crazier storms. So I know some places right now it's snowing, um, which is crazy to me because it's very warm down here. Um, but that is all an effect of climate change. We're completely imbalancing the climate. We're having colder episodes, warmer episodes. So it's allowing these species to expand more. So say if it's a warmer fish, now that the waters are getting warmer, nor more north, they're able to go up the coast, for example, of the United States. So say they always stay in Florida, now they can start expanding up the east coast of the United States. Um, so climate change is a big issue. We're making the waters a lot warmer for them to be able to expand their territory more. Um, and just also with climate change, we have more intense storms, which will blow in different organisms to different areas as well. Okay. The next one is transportation. Now, I, I've actually talked about this first example. I mean, one of my other lessons, I don't exactly remember which one. I think it was ocean. No, no, no. It's a coral disease lesson. Um, but ballast water in ships. So, guys, big ships. They'll actually, when they're in their first port, the port is where they dock, all right? Um, big ships, they'll actually suck in a bunch of ocean water to help balance their ship. So they actually bring in water to balance. And once they get to the next port, they'll actually release all that water. So they're putting water from one area into another area. And that's a very common way for invasive species to transfer. They'll actually get sucked in by that ballast water and then spit out in a new location. Other um, examples of transportation is a boat haul and a boat trailer. So just the boat itself can have a lot of growth on it. And when you take it out of the water and bring it to another um, boat ramp, another area, you're now transporting all that growth into a new area. Um, also cargo. So think about like lumber, logs and wood. Those little creatures can actually kind of climb into those things and then they'll travel with that big truck to a new location. Um, down here in the Keys, we don't have squirrels, but um, in a lot of our bigger lumber trucks, the squirrels from the mainland will actually climb into those lumber trucks. And when that truck unloads at one of our lumber stores, um, like Home Depot, for example, the squirrels will climb out and then we have squirrels. So that's one example of transportation as well. All right, guys. Um, then there's also what we call accidental release. So accidental release is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you accidentally release something. You don't mean to um, say something. It's kind of like the transportation away. They're not trying to release it. So these two can kind of go hand in hand in a way. Um, but a smaller example, um, I know a lot of people that will camp in the Dry Tortugas. That's a national park nearby. And there's a lot of hermit crabs in the Dry Tortugas. And I've seen a lot of times, because I used to work on the boat that would go back and forth a lot of people would accidentally bring back a hermit crab. A hermit crab would climb into their bag and then we'd find them on the boat. They'd come back and give it to us and be like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I accidentally took this hermit crab from the park. And then we had to bring it back. Um, so that's a great example of an accidental release where you know the animal might crawl into one of your belongings and you have no idea. Maybe you are carrying, you somehow got some seeds in your bag or some seeds stuck to you and now you're transporting this new plant. Um, again, just like boats, you don't really know. Same with, um, what they're talking about with coral disease. You know, you could be transferring that with your dive gear, your equipment, your boat. Um, it's all accidental. Um, other, maybe other examples are science lab escapes, um, or an introduction. So maybe science experiments and they introduce it to the wild and it turns into a much bigger issue. Um, other plants that may have the seeds may have blown away or maybe the birds also transported them and other escaped domestic animals. So when an animal escapes, um, it's not really your fault per se, um, but that could be another accidental release category. All right, then the last one is your intended release. 
So a lot of these, um, a lot of our invasive species that we're going to talk about today are actually intended to be released and then turn into a problem. So an intended release is the intentional release of a species outside of their na native range. Um, maybe you have a pet and that pet got too big for the tank, so you released it. That's a very, very popular way that invasive species will make their way into a new ecosystem. Um, bait, live bait releases and the aquarium trade, um, illegal release of other animals. So that's the intended release. All right, guys, so we're gonna talk about some main um, invasive species now. Uh, most of them are very popular in the United States. However, some of them are common in other place, uh, places of the world too. So the first one is the lionfish. So the lionfish, um, if you have that worksheet, it's that first one there. And the lionfish is really, really interesting looking fish. It's actually from the South Pacific. So it's native to the Pacific Ocean, um, but it was first spotted in South Florida in 1985, but began to really explode in the 2000s. Um, the lionfish is actually a very popular aquarium fish because it's so cool looking. Um, but they get really, really big really quickly and they eat a lot. So we started seeing them in South Florida in the 1980s, but now they've become a re really, really big problem. Um, they can also inhabit one foot of water to 300 feet. So they have a huge range of to what, how deep they can go. So they can go as shallow as one foot of water to as deep as 300 feet. So they have a big range there, which is makes them even better, more successful as an invasive species. Uh, they consume over 50 different species of fish here. They have 18 venomous spines. So they have these really cool spines everywhere and they are venomous. Um, they can spawn or reproduce or lay eggs every four days. So they can reproduce very quickly. And when they lay eggs, they release their eggs in batches between 12,000 to 15,000 each. So think about that. That lionfish is laying over 10,000 eggs every four-ish days. That's a lot. Um, and that's what you'll notice with these invasive species. They can lay a lot of eggs in a very short amount of time. Um, also about lionfish, they can handle different depths of water, but they can also handle different temperatures. So they can handle really warm water, really stagnant water, really dirty water, it's really clean, cold water as well. Um, so they can handle a lot of different um, environmental things, factors going on. So let me ask you guys this. Can we eat lionfish? Yes or no? Remember guys, it's supposed to be in the South Pacific. It's got those 18 venomous spines. Can we eat lionfish? I'll Do you think we can eat lionfish? Yes. All right, so the answer is actually yes. You can eat lionfish. Now, remember I said they have 18 venomous spines. So here's a little lesson for you guys here. Um, there's a difference between venomous and poisonous. So venomous means that it has to be injected. Poisonous means ingested. So poisonous ingested, venomous injected. So for it to be poisonous, that means you would have to consume it to some degree, whether it gets absorbed by your skin or whether you eat it. So think of like in the old days, it had like the poison goblet, um, things like that in like the medieval times. Um, so you'd have to consume something for it to become, for it to be poisonous. Venomous means that it has to stick you. So these lionfish have 18 venomous spines. However, if you just cut off those venomous spines, obviously you have to do it very carefully. If you cut them off, um, then you can fillet it like a normal fish. And it's actually pretty good. I had lionfish last week. Um, and it's a really, really sustainable resource. So guys, you can eat lionfish. They are not poisonous, so you can eat them. If they're poisonous, you couldn't. But because they're venomous, as long as you cut off the spines, totally good. Now, there are a lot of things that we're doing to combat um, the lionfish here in the Florida Keys, especially. We have what we call lionfish derbies. Um, so lionfish derby is just where they all go out on one day or over a weekend and they spear as many lionfish as possible. And whoever gets the most lionfish or the biggest lionfish wins prizes. So it's like a competition. It's an easy way and a fun way to get rid of a lot of lionfish at one time. Um, when you spear a lionfish, though, you do have to use um, much more protective equipment. Make sure you don't get stung by them. 
I have a few friends that have been stung by a lionfish and that really ruins their day. Um, in the next few days, they don't feel as well either. So you definitely don't want to get stung by them. It's not fun. Um, another thing that we're doing is just encouraging people to eat lionfish. So what I just told you guys, you can eat lionfish. It's very important for us to encourage these restaurants to start serving lionfish. They're creating lionfish cookbooks. Um, lionfish, that meat is actually very similar to hogfish. If you guys like seafood, it's a very, very good fish to eat. It doesn't taste bad at all. Personally, guys, I don't like to eat seafood and I think it tastes pretty good. So that should say something to you. Um, but if we encourage more people to eat lionfish, that's also good for all the other fish in the ocean. A lot of our native species are suffering overfishing. Um, and if we just encourage people to eat more of an invasive species, then that's going to take a lot of pressure off of our native species. So that's a very important thing to think about. Um, we also just have sighting reports. So if you see a lionfish, you can call a number and say, hey, I just saw a bunch of lionfish here. You might want to send someone out to get rid of them. Um, also, the Dry Tortugas National Park, which is near uh, close to Key West, they actually have an intern every summer that will actually be out at the park and make sure that there's no lionfish, um, kill any that they see, and we'll do a lot of research on the lionfish there. So that's pretty cool as well. All right, the next invasive species that I have for you guys today is the zebra mussel. So guys, a mussel um, is a bivalve mollusk. So remember that from our invertebrate lesson. So it's a zebra mussel. It's named that because it has little stripes on its shells. They're very, very smaller. They're smaller than 50 millimeters. And it's native to Russia and Ukraine. So they're not native to here, but um, if you, especially if you guys live near around Michigan, they have exploded in the Great Lakes and really taken over. They've really become a problem. They're also a big problem in some European areas as well. But again, guys, they're native to Russia mostly, um, but they've made their way, especially to the Great Lakes um, in America and the United States. They can lay 40,000 eggs at a time and up to 1 million in a season. They arrived here in about in around the 1990s, most likely from ballast water. So scientists think that a boat came from Russia and sucked in that water and ended up sucking in a few of those zebra mussels. And when it came to the Great Lakes and released all that ballast water, all those zebra mussels that got sucked in now had a new home. And then they exploded and competed with the other organisms in that area. Um, so a big issue with them is that they consume a lot of the plankton biomass. So a lot of the very beginning um, beginners of the food chain, um, they've consumed those. And they also attach to a lot of structures, which creates a lot of weight and breaks them easier. I was reading how these zebra mussels are attaching to different pipes um, that are very essential for like electrical wires and just transporting water. And they'll actually end up breaking um, those pipes over time. So guys, a few things that we're doing or what we encourage is don't let your boat sit in the water, especially if you're in an area um, with those zebra mussels. Take your boat out of the water. Don't let it sit because then they can grow longer. They can't grow in the air. So take your boat up, get a boat lift, put your boat on the trailer. Make sure that you use your boat often as well. Um, they like to, they grow easier on just stagnant things. So docks, right? Um, if that boat is just staying in one spot for a very long time, it makes it much easier for those muscles to grow. So make sure you're moving that boat, using it. If you're not using it, take it out of the water, lift up your motor between uses, make sure you rinse off your boat and your equipment. So if you're boating in that area and you take your boat out of the water, rinse it with fresh water, uh, make sure you're cleaning it off so that there's no growth on it. You can also apply a special paint on that on your boat so that it, it won't stick to it. Also, guys, I forgot to mention um, with the lionfish. So the lionfish, you know, when they came here, there was no natural predators. But um, really cool. A lot of our bigger apex predators in the food chains are now learning how to eat these guys. Uh, just last week, we actually watched a shark eat a lionfish. Um, so sharks are actually eating lionfish now. They've built up a tolerance to the venom. Goliath groupers also eat a lot of lionfish. So sharks and goliath groupers are very important because they're eating the lionfish for us. Um, so, you know, if you give it enough time, you know, the natural ecosystem will figure out how to combat it, which is really cool, but we still have to do all we can to make it easier. 
All right, another invasive species is the Burmese python. So if you guys have ever been to the Everglades or ever been to South Florida, you've probably heard of these guys. Um, they're native to Southeast Asia. Let me show you guys a picture. They can be over 20 feet long. Um, I actually saw one the other day that was over 21 feet long and it was huge and very, very strange looking. But um, let me see here. Right, here's a picture of a Burmese python for you guys. There you go. So that's what it looks like. Again, they can be over 20 feet long. They have completely taken over the Everglades National Park, that whole area. The guys, the Everglades are a very, very important area for us. Um, what happens in the Everglades does affect what happens in our coral reef. Um, and fortunately, they have taken over. And they have destroyed certain small mammal populations by 90% since 1997. So there has been a 90% reduction in our small mammals in the Everglades um, because of these guys. That's really, really bad. 90% um, of all the small mammals have disappeared and been eaten because of these pythons. Um, a Burmese python is a common pet. So a lot of people will get it when they're smaller. And once they get too big, obviously you can't really have a tank in your house for a 20 foot long snake. Um, but once they get too big, it's very common that people will just release them into the wild. So some things that we're doing is there's actually this really interesting thing called a python derby. So once a year, um, they actually will allow hunting in the Everglades. You have to apply for a permit and all that. But they'll allow hunters to go into the Everglades National Park, which normally you can't do, and just hunt any python that they can see. So they'll allow hunters to go in and try to get as many pythons as possible. Um, you're also allowed to hunt them on private land. So if you see a Burmese python um, on someone's land, you can uh, kill it. That way you can remove it from that ecosystem. Um, another thing that you can do is if you have that, pet, if you have a Burmese python as a pet, don't release it. Find an, a captive area, maybe a zoo or something like that and give it to them. That way they can put it in a bigger enclosure um, and they'll have the resources to actually take care of it. Right, guys, and we have the cane toad. Some of you guys have probably heard of the bufo toad. Um, it's a very, very large toad. We have them here in the Florida Keys. You guys have them um, in most of the eastern coast of Florida. They're massive toads. Um, they kind of look like a statue almost. They're huge. They're native to Central and South America. Um, the story about this one is that they were brought to Australia in 1935 by farmers. Um, so the farmers of the sugar cane were actually having a big issue with beetles and they brought these toads in um, to deal with the beetles and they thought it'd be a good idea, but pretty soon the toads took over. The toads were actually getting themselves onto lumber vehicles and going to different territories within Australia. And here, they're also a really big problem. They're toxic to pets and humans, so they can cause a lot of irritations if a human touches them. A lot of times I've heard a lot of stories of pets that have licked them or eaten them and that pet will die. So it's very, very toxic to animals, especially. Um, in Florida, it's safe to say that if you find a toad that is bigger than four inches, it might be related to this guy. So be very careful. Some things that you guys can do with these big toes. First off, if you guys are with your pets and your pets are outside, make sure you're watching them. Um, keep an eye on them so you know that they're not getting in with those toads and not licking them or anything like that. Um, if your pet does, if you have any thought that your pet has touched or licked or bit one of those big toads, bring them to the vet immediately. Don't wait, bring them to the vet immediately. Um, other things that people that they recommend that you can do is they actually lay their eggs on the edge of a pond. So make sure that if you see their eggs, you can actually just remove them. That way they cannot reproduce those eggs. So I will show you guys a picture of their eggs. Um, so you can remove them from the edge of the pond. You can also remove that toad as well. Um, you can hunt it as well, get rid of it, but that's what their eggs look like there. You can find them on the edge of ponds. Another thing that they recommend doing is putting mesh screens near the edge of ponds to prevent those big cane toads from entering the water. Um, but guys, it is important just to know, make sure that you know what you're doing. Make sure you know what species you're looking at because you don't want to kill the native frogs and the native toads because those are very important. Um, so this one's a really tough one. Just, you know, make sure you know what's going on. Maybe if you're not sure, call your local wildlife group and they can let you know if it's, if it's correct or not. 
All right, this next one is actually a plant. So guys, plants can also be invasive. So we've got what we call the kudzu vine. So a lot of you have probably seen this before. Um, so the kudzu vine kind of looks like this, like this here. And the kudzu vine is native to Asia. It was brought to America in the 1930s as a decorative plant and to help with soil erosion. They're actually paying people to plant this in their yard. However, these kudzu vines quickly grew and they can actually grow at a rate of one foot per day. So they can grow 12 inches a day and they'll take over the native area. If you guys look, that vine completely enveloped those trees. So the trees underneath can no longer receive sunlight, cannot photosynthesize. So this right here is a big issue. I know it looks a little pretty, but it's smothering the other plants in the area and you don't want that to happen. Okay, so this is a very big issue. Again, it grows one foot per day. Another interesting thing I found is that this plant actually cycles nitrogen quicker than most plants and creates nitric oxide, um, which actually increases ozone pollution. So you talked with Miss Alex about climate change. This plant is actually contributing negatively to climate change. It is polluting the ozone with nitric oxide. So that's a problem as well. And we do consider it a type of weed. So what they are doing, they actually have released goats in the more heavily infected areas of the kudzu vines. Uh, goats will actually eat them. If you guys know, goats eat a lot of things. So goats are helping out with eating those vines. Um, you can also cut back the vine if you have it in your yard. Definitely cut it back. Don't let it grow. Let your native plants grow instead. Um, they have prescribed burnings, which is kind of hard for uh, the kudzu vines that are more well established. It helps with like the smaller ones. Um, you can dig up the roots. Again, some of them may have roots that are well developed and digging up the roots is going to be very hard. Um, and also just spot treatment. So there's different types of weed killers that people have made. If you use a weed killer, make sure you're using a more environmentally friendly one. Um, there are a lot of natural things that you can do to get rid of weeds. Um, you can just Google it online. Try not to use those really crazy fertilizer um, weed killer, all those bad chemicals. It's just bad for the environment. All right, guys, the last invasive species that I want to talk to you guys about is the iguana. If you guys have ever visited the Florida Keys, you've probably seen this guy. Um, they are pretty much everywhere. And they're really cool animals, I will say. They're very cool looking. Here is a picture of a larger male. So that's a larger male right there. So they look like dinosaurs. Um, when they're smaller, they're a very, very bright green. And, uh, let me see if I can find a small one for you guys, but they are a very popular pet species. So a lot of people will have them as pets. Um, but once they grow up is when they become a problem. So this is when it's a little bit smaller. Um, they're native to central and South America. There are a lot of different iguana species. I'm talking about the green iguana. They can also swim, so I've seen them swim before. They were first sighted in South Florida in the 1960s. Um, they weren't always an invasive species. They were considered a non-native, but more recently they have become an issue. We've got a lot of them. Um, they eat a lot of foliage, so they eat a lot of people's, uh, their plants in their yards. They can also cause structural damage. They'll dig holes. Um, and they cause a lot of damage that way as well. So these guys weren't always invasive, but now they've you know, gotten to be a problem. There's no natural predators for them, especially in the Keys, guys. We don't really have um, big predators here. Uh, it's either if our apex predator on land is going to be a bird. Um, and once those iguanas get to a certain size, the birds can't eat them. The birds can eat the smaller baby ones, but not the big ones. Um, so things that we're doing, they encourage you if you have flowers and plants to fence them in. That way the iguanas can't get in them. I see a lot of people that will actually wrap different things around their trees so that way the iguanas can't climb up um we also have an invasive species biologist here in the florida keys whose main job is to deal with the iguanas and figure out different ways to get rid of them and to make the population smaller there's also just hum humane removal so you are able to hunt them i know some people actually do eat them i have never tried that um, but that is something that can be done as well as long as it's in a humane way um 
Another thing, guys, is we have such a big iguana problem here that a lot of times they actually will crawl into like um, where a lot of our transformer boxes are, things like that for like electricity. And we have a lot of power outages because of iguanas crawling into different areas um, at like our energy plants and causing a big fault in the power line. I think last year, almost the entire Keys lost electricity for a while because an iguana got into a place it wasn't supposed to. So now the energy companies here in the Florida Keys actually are putting these wildlife jackets on their different structures to prevent that from happening because that's a pretty big problem. Also, guys, another fun fact, um, they are reptiles. And when it gets really cold, they can't move. So we had a big cold snap here in, I think, January or December. Um, and the big newspaper article was caution, falling iguanas. Um, so they were warning us that because of the cold weather, these iguanas will get really cold and just fall out of trees. So to be careful. Um, guys, so that is it on my main examples of invasive species. There are so many more invasive species. There's, I mean, look up the ones that are in your area. I'm sure you guys have different ones as well. Um, but there's a lot of different examples. Uh, I have a few good videos, um, especially a longer video in the blog post that I have, um, that I have the website on in the about description. Go look at those videos. It's pretty cool to learn about them. You can see more pictures. Finish that worksheet that I gave to you guys. Um, color in all the species. Learn more about what spe invasive species you have in your area. I do want to just finish with this note. Um, you know, I know a lot of people love to have different animals as pets. But no matter what pet you have, even in, just whatever pet you have, make sure that you have the ability to take care of it all the way through its life. Um, whether it's a snake, whether it's a turtle, a tortoise, or even a cat or a dog, before you get a pet, you guys need to make sure that you can take care of it for its entire lifetime. Um, a lot too many people will get a turtle or a tortoise or a snake and not realize that those get really big. Tortoises can live for a very long time. Um, so if you can't take care of an animal for the entirety of his lifetime for as big as it can get, don't get it, all right? And if you are one of those that are dealing with that issue right now where you have this pet, maybe you have a snake or an iguana and you were thinking about releasing it to the wild, but now you're like, maybe I shouldn't. Find a place that will take it. Find a rescue or find a zoo um, or find an area that will take it instead. Don't release your pets. Make sure you you can take care of them before you buy them. All right, guys. So that's the end of my lesson today.